Okay, um, so a lot has changed in the past three or four years with the pandemic. Um, talking a little bit louder now, hopefully that helps. Um, but some attorneys who were specialized in, say, labor and employment became very specialized in other areas as well. Attorneys started to wear more hats, um, cover a lot more ground with less resources. Um, and truthfully, not a ton has terribly changed since that happened. Um, companies have figured out they needed to get lean, uh, adopt things like technology to aid their attorneys with workload concerns, uh, burnout concerns. Um, so there's a lot that we'll address on that front. And as always, we encourage questions or comments that you feel may value, add value to some of the things your peers are doing, uh, especially if you do something very well that we're talking about. Or on the flip side of that, if you're looking to improve and looking for a, a partner in the room that has a good process in place and you would like to share some best practices after the event. Uh, Manny and I will stick around afterwards too for any kind of questions and we have a, round, a nice round table discussion with some top questions um, for the second part of the presentation. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Manny to kick things off. Thanks. All right, well, good afternoon, guys. Um, like Susan said, it's been a couple of years since we were able to do uh, an event with uh, the ACC members here in DFW and you know, what, if, what a difference a few years can make, right? I mean, post-pandemic, pre-pandemic, it's, it's been a lot within these past couple years. So, um, you know, during 2021, the legal market experienced its best financial year since, you know, before the 08 crisis. And the legal market saw unprecedented demand growth in transactional practices and employee headcount. Um, that combination drove, you know, fees and revenues up significantly, which produced record profits for 2021. And then contrast with 2022, we have a lot of growing political and economic uncertainty um, that sig significantly reduced the appetite for, um, you know, transactional work within the legal market. Um, and, you know, combined with that uncertainty, about the depth and the, du the duration of the you know, economic downturn throughout the world. Um, the challenge of returning to the office, um, continuing issues of talent retention, um, the impacts of ongoing market segmentation, um, all set the stage for a very challenging 2023. Um, and as we know, times of uncertainty always create anxiety within organizations and a tendency to kind of you know, hunker down and protect against both real and imagined dangers. Um, and to lead successfully through these kinds of periods, periods require leaders like yourselves to embrace, you know, somewhat different priorities and openness and uh, willing to experiment with a, a new way of doing things. Um, you guys being in in-house legal departments are on the front lines of an ever-shifting operational landscape and you are the ones that are expected to you know counsel very complex topics uh, that come up right now would be AI it would be cyber threats cyber security um, ESG regulations you know the, no no other business unit holds such a critical role in advising all of those facets within you know a corporation or a law firm um and so you know that that is definitely uh a big evolution um with y'all's businesses and so as you know lawyers or general counsels or executive counsels you know y'all are the ones that are tasked with juggling these expectations um some of the insights that we have here are from our 2023 um, state of the corporate legal department um, that goes across you know amlaw 100 200 firms um, in-house counsel uh, corporations so um, you know we've seen uh, you know 85 percent that of the you know folks that we talk to view controlling costs as a top priority um, and you know over half also say that bringing more work in house is a top priority because it helps reduce outside counsel spend it helps retain talent within your organization it allows your um, departments to see who your change agents are right and it creates opportunity within the business um, so you know how many people here just by a show of hands can relate to that type of uh, evolution within their corporations Good, majority, majority, great. 
we'll move on to the next slide. Um, out of out of all of these ever changing priorities, you know, regulatory um, and compliance concerns have become paramount for corporate le legal leaders globally. Um, you guys all strive to establish, you know, robust compliance programs, monitor regulatory changes, and you know, implement effective risk management strategies to navigate, you know, the complex legal landscape um, that safeguards your organization's interests. So um, here we have, you know, number one concern across the globe for corporate legal leaders is regulatory and data privacy standards. Um, and these standards are, you know, uh, driven by several factors. Um, could, you know, increasing, you know, increasing regulatory complexity, right? Um, stringent enforcement and penalties. Uh, globalization and, and cross-border operations for those of you that work for companies that are international, um, data privacy and cybersecurity, uh, collaboration and cross-functionality, um, reputational risk, that, that's probably a big one. Um, so as we know, you know, companies operate in an environment where laws and regulations are continually evolving, um, spanning, you know, various jurisdictions, whether they're um, domestic or international, um, and being able to stay compliant with these regulations has become a top priority to you know, mitigate legal and financial risks. Um, you know, the increasing focus, you know, here we have, um, you know, kind of like a chart that talks about anticipated future risks and, um, you know, Stephen and myself, we work with a lot of um, companies like yourselves uh, across the, the world. And, you know, the increasing focus on data protection and privacy driven by regulations like, um, you know, the GDPR has made, you know, data compliance a significant concern for corporate legal leaders. And so, you know, protecting your customers um, and your employee data and ensuring compliance with those, you know, protection laws is, is, is very crucial um, to your operation. And non-compliance with those regulations can, you know, damage a company's reputation. Uh, it can certainly erode customer trust um, and all leads to, you know, long-term negative consequences. Um, so you guys as corporate leader, legal, legal leaders recognize the importance of maintaining, you know, a strong reputation by adhering to these requirements and, and avoiding this type of, the, those types of breaches, so. Yeah, and I think it's important to note, like, most companies have become data companies. Uh, I heard the example from one of our clients, Dairy Queen is a data company now. They have an app. The app has customer information stored. Uh, for purchasing and you know buying services things of that nature so they are now a data company they have customer information there's been a huge a couple large obviously enterprises your, your Facebook's of the world your metas of the world uh, that are in the headlines for some of those violations but that doesn't mean that the smaller corporations aren't at the same risk I think it's a point of you know making them kind of a scapegoat for things but um, everyone essentially is becoming a data company in today's environment and, and understanding how the, uh, the restrictions and regulations evolve uh, quickly is important, whether that be through having a strategic partnership with a law firm who specializes in that space, or leaning into technology that, or resources you know, in a technology platform that gives you that same information to keep you up to date on everything that's changing and when and where. Um, but it's just something important and, and become a heightened focus across the conversations that we're having in the in-house environment. Great, thanks. Um, so, you know, as we see here, you know, large corporate legal departments are seeking greater value by, you know, implementing various strategies and initiatives. Um, you know, the, this chart here says, you know, that, it, you know, 50% of buyers have adjusted their law firm rosters in the last year. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things that um, companies are doing across different industries. Um, some of these initiatives, you know, are obviously technology adoption, um, process improvement, uh, strategic alignments, um, 
ALSPs, which are you know alternative legal service providers, and we'll talk about that in, on the next slide. Um, but metrics and data and KPIs, like you know, that's that's where you know the efficiencies are are moving towards, and um, corporate law departments are heavily adopting uh, tools and technology that are able to let them in on their internal metrics and, and data analytics. Um, so, you know, speaking of technology adoptions, um, you know, there's a lot of emerging uh, technology solutions that streamline, you know, your operations. Um, they automate, you know, repetitive tasks that, you know, someone might be in charge of, um, enhance efficiencies, but investing in legal tech tools such as, you know, contract management systems or e-discovery platforms or um, AI-powered document uh, analytics. Um, all of those are going to be uh, types of technology that you can uh, use to optimize your workflows, reduce costs, and ultimately improve, you know, the overall value that you present uh, to your business. So bringing it back to the ALSPs, um, you know, th that is probably one of the biggest investments that we have seen um, over the past couple of years, especially since the pandemic. You know, um, I know, you know, just with experience of working with some some companies, uh, some of these corporations were operating off desktops in their in their businesses, and their employees didn't have laptops. And so when the pandemic hit, they had to shift gears, you know, instantly, and invest in that technology and you know, you give someone a laptop, that's great, but what are they going to do with that? You know, how are they going to stay connected to the business and how are they going to, um, it, you know, continue with their workflows un uninterrupted? And so that's where we have seen uh, a great investment into ALSPs um, and, you know, the corporate legal departments specifically um, are heavily exploring partnerships with you know, some of these services that access, you know, specialized expertise for maybe, you know, a certain vertical within the legal department, everything's, you know, what I've found is that, you know, corporate legal departments can be very siloed and they can be very segmented. And so um, being able to, you know, have access to, to a tool um, to access, you know, a specialized expertise is, is uh, you know paramount to productivity for some some folks, um, but overall you know ALSPs offer a range of services including you know document review, compliance support, uh, like I said earlier, contract management, uh, litigation support, um, and by leveraging these types of technologies, uh, legal departments can allocate their resources more effectively and focus on high value tasks. Uh, and achieve greater cost efficiency. Ultimately, you know, you guys can leverage technology and bring more work in-house um, and reduce that outside council spend that, you know, we'll discuss further in this presentation, but, you know, we've seen a massive increase on, you know, outside council spend. So um, it's a, a very heavy area where corporate legal departments are trying to, you know, innovate and fine tune what they're spending um, so that they can, you know, navigate the, you know, economic downturn, not just here in the United States, but throughout the world. Um, and I think one area that is challenging for in the in-house space is resources are limited. Uh, you're operating very lean already. And typically when you're talking about adoption of technology, there has to be an owner of said technology and a champion and someone that's really going to run with that. So you're, in, you're likely putting that on top of someone's current day-to-day. -day. Uh, so you have to have someone who has that bandwidth and often you can't find it. So while the technology will bring a lot of advantages and a lot of streamlining of, of processes, it's not always sustainable if you don't have that person who can champion the technology. So uh, Jason Barnwell, he's a, the head of digital transformation at, at Microsoft. Um, 
recently discussed this topic and he actually found that a lot of uh, in-house leaders that he speaks with have, uh, have chimed in with managed services, um, actually outsourcing the management of the technology because the technology brings all of the advantages they need to achieve their goals of cost reduction, streamlining of processes, bringing disparate systems together to, to, to have a more integrated platform vision, uh, but having a third party actually manage, you know, who has specialty in those tools, actually manage the service on their behalf, whether that be temporary or permanent. So that way they're actually realizing the value of these tools without having to hire someone to manage said tool or, or take someone away from their day-to-day -to, -day to actually manage uh, and implement a technology that's new to the department. So it's a way of just saying, let's, let's get the benefit from say a, an e-billing system and, and reduce our outside council spend, meet our goals that have been pushed down from the top and have another resource manage it until things improve and maybe we can bring that back in house or maybe you find that that's the best way to move forward is to have someone who is specialized in that area continue to manage it on your behalf. So just something to consider. Um, a lot of our clients are also starting to push work into smaller firms. Um, some that might have sat in say an AMLAW 100 space, they're, they're shifting to a smaller law firm that may be local to their geography, uh, but also specialized in the area. So producing a similar work product, uh, but for sometimes half a third of the cost that's a quick way to realize cost reduction. It can be difficult because you often have really great relationships with those firms, whether you are a part of that firm at one point or just have a great relationship and have been working together for many years. Um, it is a decision that has to be made in terms of how are you going to get there to that cost reduction goal and that is one way clients are seeing value is to shift some of that work um, and use some things like e-billing tools to identify some of those service providers and those law firms in the same geography that specialize in, say, IP matters uh, as a way of moving away from some of the larger firms. So the next topic is one that is, I, I think, very trendy right now. Um, and it's around uh, chat GPT and open AI. Um, there's a lot that's going around, uh, not just in the legal space, but outside of it, around the benefits as well as the risks that come with uh, generative AI being a part of our current landscape environment, you know, part of humanity, the path forward. Um, I found it very interesting in this slide. It does show some, some statistics in terms of fastest uh, to, I think it's one million uh, users for their respective services. Um, Chat GPT, you know, your, your Netflix, which is a huge streaming platform, took three and a half years to reach a million uh, users or subscribers, whereas Chat GPT took five days. Um, that to me says that AI is here, AI is here to stay, and it's only going to become ever present in our day to day, not only in a legal world, but outside of it in terms of how do we educate our children, uh, how do we buy groceries, there's all types of things. Uh, how do we what type of marketing are we receiving? Is it from a bot or is it from an, a human on the other side? Um, how images are produced? Uh, as many of you have seen, there's a lot of apps that produce you know, uh, headshots for you now via an app and using ge uh, generative AI. I see some laughing over here, so maybe some use of those. Um, so in terms of these large language models, they don't actually understand human conversation. So they take, they're trained with they have trillions and trillions of words that are pushed into the model, hence the, the name large language model, and they assign probability to word sequences. So they basically are guessing the, the best answer based on probability of how to respond to a specific question or task or how to format something based on what's been pushed into the system already and these trillions of words produced. Um, go ahead, advance. And so that's where you see some of the, the legal ramifications right now where, where people are trusting the, the AI tools to come up with case law or um, asking, putting proprietary information into the tool. So there's just a lot that companies need to be weary of in terms of all of the benefits, but there's also risks to, to consider um, when it, you're talking about a company and you have employees, how is AI being deployed? Uh, what type of company information are they putting into these tools and how secure are those environments to where 
say a competitor might see something that's proprietary. Uh, there's another example of that. We won't name names, but um, OpenAI founder Sam Altman um, and then the founder of uh, DeepMind, those are two of the more prominent names in the AI space right now. Um, one being tied to Google, the other with a heavy investment from Microsoft. Um, they are urging caution and they are urging regulation, which is very rare as a CEO of a company when you're facing massive profits from the use of your tools and the growth of your tools and the, the reputation of changing the world. Um, I, I heard it compared to the biggest, will produce the biggest change since electricity or the internet. Uh, that's a bold statement, but we'll see if that comes true. Uh, but they are urging regulation from the government because while there's a lot of good that can come, again, there's a lot of bad. Um, not everyone is out in everyone's best interest, whether that be a company or an individual. Um, the owner of DeepMind actually wrote that AI, the current ChatGPT uh, 4, it's their fourth iteration of the tool, actually has the power to produce new deadly chemicals. Um, it was even used to spew uh, toxic hate speech uh, that went viral across the world. Um, funny, as we mentioned, the, the imagery, uh, the headshot tool, um, Prisma Labs is one of the companies that came up with it, the app, it's called Lensa. And they got blasted in the media for um, how their headshots actually sexualized all of the people that put their photos into it when those images that were input were not uh, in intended to be sexy. So there's a lot that needs to be considered when you're looking at AI. Um, how does that kind of translate into the corporate environment or the in-house environment? So a few examples um, for, for IP, you're looking at things like protect protectability of AI-generated content. How are you going to secure those things? What type of proprietary information is being entered into the tool? Um, what type of, if you're looking at a software space of your company, what type of code are they using the tool for? Uh, you can write a program in, in OpenAI in less than an hour, uh, technically using the tool. But how much of that code is proprietary? Uh, and what type of restrictions and training do your employees actually have in terms of how they're able to access the power of AI? Um, it's all very new. It's happening rapidly. But it's not going away. Um, there's a lot of signatures on a, a, a nice forum that it, you know from people like Elon Musk that are asking for a uh, like a six month hiatus from investment and development in AI. But so far, nothing's been done with it. Uh, I think companies are, are grasping uh, everything they can with AI, uh, especially from a marketing standpoint. Anything you read now says something about artificial intelligence. Um, from labor, again. I think the, a big concern here is you see the statistic on the slide around legal as being one of the most likely uh, verticals to have job replacement because of AI. Um, it's a scary stat um, and there are a lot of functions I'm sure some of you could think of that could be automated uh, and those need to be considered. So when you're thinking about where, how do you, re, you know, position somebody in the company, where once that's automated, uh, are you reducing the workforce or are you really maximizing their fullest potential in terms of, of their education and their qualifications. Uh, maybe they're doing a lot of data entry, uh, which is something that AI will eventually take control of uh, in terms of accuracy and speed. It's just a better option. But maybe that person who's doing data entry has other qualifications that could add a lot of value to the company. So it's time to start considering those things about how those people could be repurposed and also form them to, to manage some of these higher level tasks as other things become automated. Um, data privacy laws, again, I think Manny touched on this earlier, are ever changing uh, at, on a domestic level as well as global. You have things like GDPR on a global scale. You have things like CCPA in a domestic scale. New York has been working on their version of the CCPA for some time. Uh, I, I would imagine at some point it's going to go federal. So there's just a lot to be considered and that's going to play into AI as well. Uh, from a commercial standpoint, again, talking about confidential information being, being used when you do automate some of these things, what type of information is being put into the, the, the platform and um, 
marketing purposes, how well are your marketing professionals versed on what they can and can't say in marketing materials around AI? Uh, how much of it's true and how much of it's going to be relevant in your product or in your service? Um, them having the formal training in terms of what they can and can't say is vital so that you don't get called out because that is, of course, when legal gets involved in something you don't necessarily want to be involved in. Um, there, there's a common example of uh, with AI, and I think this applies to the company environment too, is with Facebook, uh, they chose the approach of move fast um, and fix it later, basically. Uh, launch the platform as fast as possible, gain adoption, get as many users as you can, and as those issues occur, they'll fix them on the spot. Well, we've seen how that's worked out. They've got huge issues with data privacy, uh, a lot of slander that happens on their platform that they, they didn't have any kind of control or measures in place to limit at the time. Um, you've seen stuff like that with Instagram and, and Facebook now where you can get removed from Facebook, but then you just create a new profile to produce the same content that's been viol in violation. Uh, so the, the owner of uh, DeepMind said, I'm gonna use Facebook as an example and by not moving fast and breaking things. Um, so that's where he's urged regulatory regulations to be uh, put on AI uh, so that people are very cautious with how they move forward with the use of it in their, in their products and services. Um, now, not to be a Debbie Downer, so there's a lot of positives that come from AI as well. Um, figured I'd get the risks out of the way first before he jumped into the happy stuff. Um, there was a, a recent example, it's, it's a company called AlphaFold that actually predicted using an AI model, it was ChatGPT4 and then I guess they evolved the model a bit to predict the 3D structures of all the proteins and all the amino acids that make up the body. Um, and until that point, we didn't have a good understanding of how those amino acids and proteins form to create these structures um, that really facilitate like behavior in the body. And they were able to do this, something that scientists have worked on for, I think it was over 100 years or something like that. They were able to do in a matter of months um, using AI. And so it just gave everyone a new understanding of how those amino acids function in the body and, and the actual output. Um, so just another, like in terms of healthcare, huge monumental jumps that are happening in terms of new vaccines being created. They're able to put thousands and uh, hundreds of thousands of medical journals into an AI platform and run continuous code where there's the human element where you need to take breaks, you get burnout, you have to have the actual scientists in a lab to perform this type of research. That AI model can be continually running across all of these journals and basically performing research and creating new ways to get to a new formation of a vaccine that's gonna have a higher probability of success. You still have the human element of performing the testing uh, in terms of how it's going to actually be effective with a human. That testing does require a human element, but again, just getting us to a faster point of, of good things to come in, in the world. Um, it's being looked at for things like nuclear fusion to uh, solve the fossil fuel crisis, some would say, um, fight plastic pollution in a variety of ways. Um, we're not quite there to, there's a term, artificial general intelligence. Um, basically, the machine can think, learn, and understand just like a human. Um, and we're about, we're a few years out from that. I, I'm not the expert, of course, but that's what I've read. Um, and I think that's true. I think there's a, a hu an important human element, and if we enforce certain regulations, it will also slow down the, the, the dramatic impact that it's had so far um, so that we're deploying AI in the right way. Um, in terms of legal technology, there's a lot of different ways that AI is being integrated into tools or already is integrated in tools. I think one of the most popular is going to be contracts. Um, contract intake is a good example. So automating the process of the intake from how the work is routed to legal in the first place, ensuring that all of that information is put in on the front end and then it follows a certain workflow to produce exactly what a, an attorney needs to get started on the project right away versus going back and forth via email, asking a whole lot of questions. Um, that is probably, is, is already a current use case and a very common one. Um, other would be using AI to scan 
thousands of contracts in your database to pick out specific language and also understand intent um, as a way of finding every force majeure clause as, as was very popular to, during the pandemic, finding all of those and instantly identifying how they differ um, and how the language needs to be modified in contracts as they renew. Um, that's just another way that AI is being integrated into contract tools. Uh, regulatory, I think there's a lot of different ways that people are tracking regulations uh, using AI, how uh, there's different scanning uh, technologies that understand and, and search a variety of publications and, and, and legal standards across the world to understand where, when regulations are changing and how they've changed, and then also provide context as to how that impacts your specific geography. Uh, document drafting, we kind of talked about the, the ability to enter uh, prompts or, or key points and actually produce a document in its entirety. I want to write a memo and I want it to describe these four goals and I need it to be a one pager and AI will actually produce the document. What that does for you saves you a whole lot of time. Time is money, uh, time is precious in my opinion. Um, and time is something we have little of in terms of our day to day. The hours seem to race by. Uh, so having something that's gonna automate that process as much as possible. Using predefined templates is another common example. Our clients uh, tell us that whether it's our technology or others, having everything already pre-formatted saves not only the end user time, but legal a lot of time too, because there's a lot less proofing, um, a lot less red lines as many of you I'm sure love. Um, uh, legal research is another example. Um, the ability to type in a simple question into a search bar and have it produce the actual answer with relevant case law instead of multiple answers, multiple cases, but have it produce the exact result you're in search of. Um, a way of just getting to the actual answer you need a lot faster by having a tool that continually trains itself based on laws and regulations as they change and how the questions are input into the system um, it's become quite impressive, honestly, and it's what a lot of law firms have actually already deployed, um, and it's how they're answering a lot of your questions, as I'm sure you know. Um, so a lot of clients are starting to bring some of that front-end research in-house uh, through use of these tools, um, and able to, it enables them to respond to internal requests a lot faster instead of sending it outside and waiting till the next day or the day beyond that to get an answer to your CFO or CEO. Um, and then of course, things like IP management, um, really identifying potential infringements, um, identifying opportunities to protect your assets. Uh, obviously, there's a lot that we've talked about and covered in terms of data privacy and I IP controls that need to be in place. AI is going to play a big part in that space as well, in terms of proprietary uh, information, confidential information, so something to look out for in your tools as they develop.